Good morning. Thanks for coming today. And Father, bless. Well, our topic this morning is Orthodox asceticism and its role and purpose in our Christian lives. And I expect our talk will take about 45-ish, maybe 50 minutes. Uh, and, but we're going to cover a lot of ground. So stick with me. Um, and by the way, if you miss things, I have two handouts on the back uh, corner that will help you recapture some of what we go over, some quotes with their references, and I think an excellent um, summary of the passions and their spiritual antidotes, according to the Patristic Fathers. Asceticism, as you probably all know, is an integral part of the Orthodox Christian life. In fact, it's a distinguishing element, especially today, from most Christian faith traditions from which asceticism is essentially absent. But as with any institutionalized part of any tradition of long standing, you know, asceticism runs the risk of being or being perceived as legalism or mere custom and convention especially if we as Orthodox Christians aren't clear as to what it is for, you know, what its purpose is, and that's what we'll be talking about today. You know, you hear things like sometimes, oh, Orthodoxy is great, but we have to do all this stuff, but I don't really get the point of it. And so one of the first questions to ask is, what is this guy doing up here talking about asceticism? Well, I must confess that I personally struggled with understanding the purpose of asceticism in my Christian life, especially its relationship to salvation, uh, which is one of the reasons I enthusiastically took on the research uh, on this. So my opening question rhetorically is, why do we as Orthodox Christians have these varied ascetical practices like fasting, vigils, morning and evening prayers, almsgiving, obedience to a spiritual father, you know, regular confession, taming of our thoughts and passions. How are these connected to our salvation? Are these just, you know, old rituals, old customs that grew up through the ages in Christian history and just stuck and we're kind of stuck with them? Or is there something deeper involved? So that's kind of my underlining question here, which we'll be exploring. And, you know, given our time, culture, and the many Christian denominations and movements that many of us, especially here in this parish, came out of, asceticism is often a very difficult part of our faith to understand. And this general confusion about asceticism is articulated well, I think, by Klaus Kenneth, the author of the book uh, Born to Hate, Reborn to Love, when he writes, people who are attached to whatever they enjoy in their current life, have difficulty accepting the idea that they need to sacrifice anything for the sake of eternal life, end quote. Well, as I've been uh, studying orthodoxy and asceticism, I find several key reasons for the difficulty in comprehending the ascetic teachings of the orthodox faith, which perhaps many of you share. First, we're Americans. We're not exactly an ascetic people. Contemporary American culture and cultures like Western Europe stand in stark contrast to the self-restrained ascetic life. And in truth, our secular cultural life has become one where comfort, desire of wealth, possessions, really appears to be the goal and purpose of existence. And this is turning us, maybe has turned us, into a hedonistic, maybe even a narcissistic people, where the pursuit of and devotion to pleasure, especially the pleasure of the senses, and to the self, is paramount. And this is obviously quite the opposite if you read the Bible, certainly if you're introduced to our tradition, of the roadmap that our Lord and the church lays out before us, guiding us through the narrow gate and into the life beyond the physical and sensual realm. Second, and related to point one, 
Asceticism has acquired a negative connotation. It's equated with, you know, a holding back, a giving up of what one wants, even what is comfortable, even fulfilling and necessary. As a contemporary theologian explains, this is because the sinful tendencies of our nature, the habitual things that lead, a, that lead to our nature's death, have come to be considered the positive side of life. Very important. By the way, all these quotes are on that sheet in the back. But to the contrary, the church fathers teach that asceticism, contrary to what we may intuitively feel, being, again, Western uh, Americans and Western Europeans, is not negative. Rather, asceticism has a positive purpose and function. And it's medicinal. It fortifies our nature against the spiritual termites that gnaw at our nature's foundation. And in the place of the passions, which we'll be talking quite a bit about, especially later on, asceticism redirects our energies from the passions and the logismoi, which we'll also be talking about, to the virtues, which presupposes a strengthened and restored nature. So asceticism is seen by the Holy Fathers and the Church as reparative, curative, and spiritually therapeutic. As Metropolitan Harothios of Lacos tells us, the true Church's existence is demonstrated by its success in curing man. And as we know, therapies sometimes hurt. Right? Third, many of us who come out of Protestant and evangelical Christian traditions were taught, I think, as a distorted view of the relationship between salvation and ascetic struggle. Protestant and evangelical traditions have, in fact, rejected many of the classic Christian spiritual traditions and label them as what? Works righteousness. Some, and especially Calvinists, but even some hardcore evangelicals, even accuse these classic spiritual disciplines as being a form of the heresy of Pelagianism, which is kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and achieve your own salvation. And perhaps we've been more influenced by this Protestant and evangelical model of salvation in our thinking than we're aware of or willing to admit. And this is really important, I think, to understand. So I'm going to briefly digress to summarize different views of salvation before we get back to asceticism proper, because I don't think we can really understand the Lord's or the Church's teachings about asceticism without understanding the Orthodox Christian view of salvation. So we're going to take a brief detour and then come back to our main topic. Salvation in Western Christianity is characterized, as most of you know, you know, by theological premises, even innovations, like things like irresistible grace, St. Blessed Augustine and John Calvin in particular, and justification by faith alone, based on Martin Luther's interpretation of the writings of St. Paul. And according to these models, any works, even spiritual work, that's associated with salvation you know, contradicts the free nature of grace and the free gift of salvation. But as Father Georges Florovsky, whom we'll be quoting quite a bit, reminds us, St. Paul clearly distinguishes between the works of the Judaic law, put that on this side, and the works of the Holy Spirit required of all Christians. And it's significant that the early church never confused these two, the works of the Judaic law and the works required of all Christians, for they understood what St. Paul wrote. Well, the Protestant view of salvation then essentially teaches an extrinsic, from the outside, justification or salvation. Where man's status, in theological terms, his human ontology, not his actual nature, is affected by justification. 
This, by the way, comes from Norman Geisler, who said exactly this. I'm just not making this up. Therefore, sanctification, according to most schools of Reformed and Protestant theology, is not and cannot be a precondition or even a necessary condition for man's salvation. Sanctification is not and cannot be a precondition for salvation. It's got to be by the pure grace of God from the outside that just kind of washes over all people who have faith in God and faith alone. And here, and, and, and for my, my ex-Lutheran friends, forgive me. Here's an infamous quote from Martin Luther in his table talk, which I think really dramatically distinguishes most Reformation teaching from that of the church fathers. Martin Luther is reputed to have said by his students who wrote down what he said, quote, be a sinner then and sin bravely, but believe more bravely still and rejoice in Christ, who is victor over sin, death and the world. No sin shall wrest us from him. Were we even in one day to commit fornication and manslaughter a thousand times, unquote. That's from Martin Luther. Well, Father George Florovsky emphasizes that this model of extrinsic justification and salvation is one that is totally independent from any inner change within the depths of the spiritual life of a person. And therefore, it's completely different from the Orthodox tradition's teaching on salvation and what is necessary for that. Eastern Orthodox Christianity, on the other hand, teaches that salvation is not just extrinsic justification by faith alone. Yes, there is something that took place between the Father and Christ on the cross and atonement. It's described in different term, terms from the normal penal uh, justification or penal um, substitutionary atonement. And the struggle for Christian perfection is much more than that acquired in, a, in an instant by mere faith, as taught by John Wesley. As Romanian theologian Dimitri Staniloi explains, Orthodox spirituality aims at the perfection of the faithful in Christ. This perfection is rather a mystical union with God through participation in his divine human life. And Christian perfection requires a whole series of efforts until it is attained. Compare that with what Martin Luther said, and you'll start to see the very stark contrast between Reformation understandings of faith, life, and salvation from ours. Well, this striving for Christian perfection, and this was very interesting when I did my research, really is totally consistent with Holy Scripture where we read the words of our Lord like the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. We read this in Matthew. And in St. Paul who counsels us to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We read this in Philippians. And the apostles who taught in Acts that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Well, I asked myself, if relentless and serious individual effort, struggle, and spiritual warfare is not required to attain salvation, what then do these scriptural texts even mean? How would you understand them? Another Orthodox theologian writes, this is how salvation is understood in the Orthodox tradition, not in merely moral or ethical terms, but as the attainment of Christ-like perfection. This is the purpose of our human existence, to become by divine grace what Christ is by nature. So salvation or theosis, as taught by the church fathers, is union with God, not merely extrinsic justification by faith alone. And we read this in 1 Corinthians, and this is an important one to remember. It, it is written, he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. We also see biblical confirmation 
of this in the verse that is most often cited as biblical evidence for the orthodox theological teaching of theosis. That is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. There we're exhorted to become partakers of the divine nature. But here's a very important follow-up to this text in 2 Peter, which is often not followed up on. And it reads, we can become partakers of the divine nature, but only after, quote, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire, unquote. So another way to read this is one cannot become a partaker of the, of the divine nature if one has not escaped the corruption that is in the world through sinful desire. As one contemporary writer explains, in this sense, the world means all those things that are opposed to Christ and to our salvation. So we're dealing on the real tire meets the road level, not theoretical, something that just happens out there between God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And St. Mark the Poor in the Philokalia explains the theology of theosis or deification this way. He writes, the possibility of union of man with God or deification is due to the pre-existing union between divinity and humanity in the incarnation. It's Christ then who has set it before us as an aim. Union here includes all the gratuitous means of grace, baptism, holy communion, and perpetual repentance. Union also includes struggles, such as fasting, chastity, bridling of tongue and mind. It also involves constant prayer, as well as acts of love and humility. So this is all part of what the church fathers describe as the process of union with God. Not only faith, and then all this stuff is just stuff you do, or forget about it, you don't do it. We're, we're organic in the Orthodox Church. And we do these things to be part of the process of uh, attaining union with God. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And St. Paul tips us off to this spiritual state of union when he says of himself in the book of Galatians, it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. We all know that quote. St. Paul achieved this radical renunciation of a self-willed, ego-driven, and self-centered life. And this is the ultimate purpose and aim of the ascetic struggle, the ultimate emptying of the false and egoic self through what the fathers called kinosis, and its passions so as to attract and make room for the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. And this is why the ascetic struggle is a never-ending one. Because as Elder Sophroni, one of our great contemporary elders said, sooner or later, the old self will return in full force. It's not a one-time thing. So from these explanations and examples, we can see that asceticism is a participatory work of inner and outer struggle for virtue in place of the passions. It's the cooperation or the synergy of the will. We acknowledge its bent, we acknowledge its predisposition to sin, but we do not acknowledge that it's totally depraved and accompanied by the grace of God. It is not merely the following of moral and ethical rules or simply adhering to man-made regulations or ancient religious customs or traditions. And the ascetic disciplines are also referred to in scripture and holy tradition as a death, a gradual death with Christ, and an extension of the death of baptism. In the epistle of Romans, we read this very clearly. And what's wonderful about orthodoxy is once you clear away the cobwebs, you're able to go back to holy scripture and see, see it with fresh eyes as you've maybe never seen it before. And in the Epistle of the Romans, it writes, uh, St. Paul writes, 
For you live, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We're not only raised with Christ, but we must also die with him. And again, not only figuratively or symbolically. Death here refers to the death of the fallen self, sometimes known as the ego, and its passions and its attachments. As an Australian monk on Mount Athos told us, we came here to die so that when we die, we won't die. And I've thought a lot about this over the years, wondering, how do we die before we die? Well, that's what we're talking about. So despite what many Western Protestant and evangelical Christian traditions teach, salvation is not as easy as just accepting Jesus into our heart. In fact, again, the contemporary elder, Sophroni of Sussex, said to one of his spiritual children, in this world, there is nothing more difficult than to be saved. So why is salvation so difficult, we might legitimately ask? Well, this question itself, I think, is derived in part from the baggage we carry with us, from Christian traditions where grace has been substantially reduced in value. Lutheran pastor and martyr of the Nazi era, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which is one of my seminal books that led me actually out of evangelicalism and towards orthodoxy, calls this reductionist theological idea cheap grace. That is, a divine grace that is taught merely as doctrine, as principle, as a system, but one that doesn't really cost us personally anything. Well, the Orthodox Church teaches, on the other hand, that grace is costly, that discipleship is costly, it's not merely a doctrine to be assented to intellectually, and then everything that Christ accomplished is automatically imputed to us. In fact, Father Georges Florovsky calls this idea of forensic imputation a spiritual fiction, which we must expunge from our thinking if we are truly to be orthodox in our understanding of salvation. Father George further explains the participatory role of man in the process of theosis. He writes, God has freely willed a synergistic path of redemption in which man must spiritually participate. God is the actor, the cause, the initiator, the one who completes all redemptive activity, which is a mysterious thing for him to say. But man is the one who must spiritually respond to the free gift of grace. And in this response, there is an authentic place for the spirituality of asceticism, one which has absolutely nothing to do with the works of the law or with the system of merit and indulgences, which is the key thing that the reformers rejected and, frankly, in my opinion, confused. Dimitri Staniloi adds this, this union is realized by the working of the Holy Spirit. But until it is reached, man is involved in a prolonged effort of purification. Man contributes by opening himself up receptively to an ever greater filling with the life of God. Let me repeat that one. Man contributes by opening himself up receptively to an ever greater filling with the life of God. So while the Holy Fathers teach that salvation begins and ends with God, each individual must participate in thought, word, and deed. And this is not only for monks and nuns. St. John Chrysostom wrote, you greatly delude yourself and make a grave error if you think that one thing is demanded from the layman and another from the monk. For all must rise to the same height. And what has turned the world upside down is that we think only the monk must live rigorously, while the rest of us are permitted to live a life 
of indulgence. So the church, through the Holy Scriptures, her theology, liturgy, prayers, hymns, penances, sacraments, praxis, calls and guides all of us out of this perishing world with its enslavement to the transitory. It's all going to be gone. You know, I'm 65. I'm starting to get it. And its enslavement to the self, flesh, appetites, and passions, to the everlasting kingdom. And this is why Elder Sophroni says that salvation is so hard to obtain and why the church hurts. It's also important to keep in mind in this discussion that according to the Holy Fathers, salvation or perfection is not a one-size-fits-all proposition, despite what we often hear in contemporary Christianity. That is, the Fathers teach that God will judge and reward each of us according to our illumination and sanctification. And yes, the works done in the body contribute to this, not by the merit of the acts themselves, but from the effect they have on the soul. And this common understanding of salvation has been greatly diminished. That is, the common understanding that we have today of salvation has been greatly diminished. It's often taught to merely mean, you know, admission into heaven. That is, the mere escaping of damnation. And again, a sort of one-size-fits-all salvation or justification. However, again, our great father, St. John Chrysostom, writes, quote, Do not, because you hear of a resurrection, imagine that all enjoy the same benefits. And, quote, all shall not enjoy the same reward. And though all sinners be in hell, all shall not endure the same punishment, unquote. And St. Simeon, the new theologian, expands on this when he writes, quote, according to the measure which each of us has of the radiance and vision of the light, both the knowledge and the vision of God, he shall grow ever and more clear in joy inexpressible and rejoicing forever and ever. So it's not you're just there, you're walking the streets of gold, the, the, the tablets of gold are this big, and these are the cubits. These are symbolic and figurative uh, words in the book of Revelation. So in ways that go beyond our reasoning or theological formulas, salvation is directly connected to our spiritual state our purity of heart, holiness, and the good deeds we do in this life, as well, of course, preeminently by God's grace and mercy, contrary to much of what we hear in Christianity today. And throughout my personal study of asceticism, I also realized that I have carried with me a somewhat pagan or platonic-like view of the nature of the soul, that is thinking that the soul is you know, a pure, pristine, already perfected spiritual center where God always dwells, separate and untouched by the corruption of the flesh. I think I got that from my Hindu background. Well, just a word or two on that. In reality, this is not the way the Orthodox Holy Fathers understand the nature of the soul at all. In patristic thought, the human being is spirit, soul, body. And broken down into functioning parts, although they work organically, you know, together, human nature is composed this way. The life of the body consists in satisfying the instinctual physical needs, essentially those of self-preservation, food, sleep, fear, and reproduction, sexuality. The eternal soul is given by God as the life-giving force of the body in order for the body to function. And the spirit is the force in us which proceeds from God, knows God, seeks after God, and finds its rest only in God. And the soul's varied actions and movements 
are further broken down into three subcategories. So the soul, what is the soul? Well, the soul is thoughts, feelings, and desires. And while the soul and body are intimately connected, one is not separate from. The soul, by means of the sensory organs, conveys impressions to the soul. Depending on its impressions and how it responds to to them, the soul then directs the body, controlling its activities either to sin or to do good. The fathers teach, and especially this comes from the teaching of St. Theophanes the Recluse, that the soul has a higher and a lower aspect and potential. And the soul can thus be elevated or depraved because the soul is mutable. That is, it's changeable. As St. Gregory of Nyssa writes, through the faculty of perception, our soul becomes associated also with the traits which are joined with perception. So if you see something, hear something, do something, taste something that is negative, sinful, it affects the soul. Soul's got a great memory, unfortunately. These are the traits which, when they occur, are called the passions. We'll talk about that in a minute. And this is a very important point to remember as I wrap this part up. The soul, although, the soul, although lower than the spirit, occupies the main place in human life. That's kind of where we live and dwell. And the soul is not immune from corruption. In fact, far from it. And the purpose of human life is thus the striving of the human spirit towards God. We see that iconographically in the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacos. Anything less the church fathers teach is to become an animal, a soulless body, and thus to pronounce a death sentence upon ourselves. As St. Paul wrote in his epistle to the Galatians, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And I would add, we are called to do. So we see a definite tension, even a warfare, laid out before us in the scriptures between the flesh, referring to carnality in all its forms, and the spirit. And this is our constant battle. So that's a prelude to the main topic. We're off the detour. We're now back on the main highway, which I'll turn back now to, asceticism and its purpose. First, what does asceticism mean? Well, in Greek, the word askesis or askesis means spiritual training. We all understand the scientific connection between physical training, health, well-being, and physical longevity. Well, likewise, Holy Scripture and the Church Fathers, who are the physicians of the soul, teach that spiritual training is equally necessary for the health of the soul. In 1 Corinthians, we see the connection between our salvation and spiritual work by St. Paul. Although he doesn't use the word asceticism, that came later. Uh, It was introduced by St. Clement of Alexandria and uh, Origen. St. Paul writes, and you all know this verse, do, not, do you not know that in, a, that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating in the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So here we see that asceticism or spiritual training is equated with one, self-control, and two, an athletic, of course with God's grace, striving for the imperishable. What is the imperishable? Our salvation. Through spiritual exercise and self-restraint of the soul and body, We are preparing the soul for the future life. Maybe that's in a nutshell what this is all about. 
Because as we're taught in Scripture, flesh and blood cannot, what? Thank you. Inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot and will not inherit the kingdom of God. So at my age, what I'm thinking of is, I spent most of my time doing stuff in the body, building all this stuff up that is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And we'll discuss the passions and their cure soon. So what actually is the purpose of asceticism? Well, we've been talking about it, but here Dimitri Staniloi, the Romanian theologian, gives an excellent definition. He writes, the ultimate goal of asceticism is to free our nature, not only from the movement of sinful appetites, but also from the ideas that appear in the mind after the cleansing of the passions. I just read a fascinating research study that clearly and distinctly shows that our thoughts and our emotions affect our cellular makeup. Our thoughts and emotions are extraordinarily powerful and they affect the soul. This is to gain its independence from created things which have enslaved our nature by the passions and to make it long more for God. That's his definition of asceticism. Here's another one by Archbishop Averki. Asceticism is nothing other than a struggle with passions and exercise in virtues. So what are these passions that we often hear referred to in Orthodox literature and are told we must struggle against? Well, the fathers, especially St. Maximus the Confessor, teach that there are natural passions, like appetite for food, enjoyment of food, sex, sleep, fear, and so on. And these developed after the fall to aid in our physical survival. But because of the fall, these passions tend to dominate our soul and distract it from its true purpose. And without the constant direction and oversight of the spirit, soul and body can easily be turned away from their innate tendency towards the infinite, to the world, and its perishable objects. And I think, you know, let's be honest, that's where most of us live, right? Thus the Holy Fathers teach that the passions represent the corruption and the misuse of our natural passions. They're the corruption and misuse of our natural passions. And they represent the animal, the fathers call them the irrational aspects of our nature, not our nature's and our soul's higher aspects. And specifically the passions were uh, first defined and identified by Evagrius of Ponticus and are uh, eight. And they're on that sheet in the back with all the spiritual antidotes. They are gluttony, lust or fornication, avarice, anger, despair, sorrow or listlessness, often referred to as lacking of energy or a disinclination to exert effort, lethargic, Seven, vanity or self-esteem. And eight, pride or self-love. And these coincide with the seven capital sins. Gluttony, debauchery, avarice, anger, envy, sloth, and pride. And the passions, if not redirected, thus influence and subordinate our soul to its baser tendencies. And they produce a tearing and a disorder in our nature and consequently contribute to our nature's weakening. So why does the church and holy tradition tell us we must war constantly against them? Well, for one, and I found this pretty interesting, the passionate state, the state of anger, lust, fornication, despair, despondency, it draws all of our psychological, mental, and physical energies and powers towards the exterior and the material. St. Gregory of Nyssa reminds us, if these faculties are not directed by reason, but if instead the passions rule 
over the power of the mind, our humanity is, is changed from intelligence and God-likeness to irrationality and mindlessness. We are thus turned into beasts by the force of these passions. And he continues, so if one should become completely carnal or materialistic in his mind, devoting all the activity, activity and energy of his soul to the will of the flesh, such a man, even when he gets out of the flesh, is not separated from its experiences. And this makes the pangs of death much more grievous, as their soul has become partly materialized from such an environment. That kind of shook me up a little bit. So in Orthodox Christianity, the sacramental and ascetic life is the Christian life. And it stands in stark contrast to the world and its priorities. And it's not just an extracurricular activity for monks, for the pious, or the fanatical. Metropolitan Harothios Vlakos explains the cure and deification of man is achieved on the one hand by the sacramental life and on the other hand by the ascetic life. We cannot understand the sacraments without asceticism in Christ and we cannot live a real ascetic life without the sacraments of the church. So they go hand in hand. And this explains the motivation then of the great ascetic saints. And this should be our aim, obviously to our ability. Well, in case anyone still does not understand or even believe what the church and her holy tradition teaches about the need, you know, for actual, not just forensic or imputed righteousness, purity of soul as a precondition into the kingdom, then please explain to me the possible meaning of the parable of the banquet taught to us by the Lord himself. This, of course, is in the, Matthew of, uh, the Gospel of Matthew. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot cast him into the outer darkness. Into that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. I must say this scripture reading it in this context also shook me up a little bit. So the fathers teach that because no corruption can enter the kingdom of heaven, if we carry, if these ideas, these, these tendencies, these behaviors, these memories, all of this, of the carnal and material life and our passions, our appetites, our attachments, go with us in our soul to the next life. This is a problem because our fallen nature and its darkened passions are incompatible and alien to the presence of God by reason of sin a legacy to which all human beings are prone. So I see a lot of young people in here today. Thank God you got a lot of time left to work out your salvation. So what is the source of the ascetical teaching of the Orthodox faith? Well, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, our Lord initiates and commands us to practice almsgiving, prayer, fasting, humility, repentance, love of the poor, to develop righteousness, and to strive for perfection. Nowhere that I'm aware of in the Holy Scriptures or in the pre-Reformation Christian tradition is it taught that the virtues, purity, or righteousness are automatically imputed to us forensically by faith alone. On the contrary, as our Father Michael pointed out in one of his recent homilies, there's only one place in Holy Scripture where faith alone is mentioned. And it's in the epistle of St. James. And there it says what? Faith alone is what? Faith alone is dead. 
the only place it mentions it. So our, our Lord could very easily have abolished ascetic practices and taught faith alone by faith, had that been his intention. But he did not. Do you recall what our Lord did after his baptism? He went into the Judean desert and did what? Fasted for 40 days. Why? Faith alone? I don't think so. And neither did St. Paul teach this. And in keeping with these traditional teachings, the church's liturgical calendar is built around these disciplines. And whether we take them seriously and practice them in our lives and or believe they're necessary for salvation, that's, of course, an individual decision. But certainly what the church teaches is what we've been discussing. So let's really get to the heart of this. What's the purpose of asceticism in our Christian life? Well, as we read in the Bible, we're called to be holy as God is holy. Not to let God be holy and for us to have a kind of a funny relationship with God where we're, the righteousness is imputed and God doesn't see us. He sees Christ and imputes his righteousness. It's like that game where you're trying to find the nut under the bowl. Doesn't make sense. Our holiness is, of course, derived from God through union with his created energies. And we're taught that God is light and life itself. And in God there is no darkness. And God is perfect love. And this is the God through whose energies we are to become partakers of. So what does ascetic work, denial of self, mortification of the flesh, have to do with, this, with perfection? Well, one Orthodox theologian, and I also found this very interesting, speaks of asceticism or mortification of the flesh as, quote, transfer of the energy of our nature that takes place in favor of the spirit. And this just turned a light on for me and allowed me to understand the teaching of our Lord when he tells us to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I never quite understood that. I always thought that was sort of like, Oh, you're working on a crown, it's brownie points, you're already saved, don't worry about it, it's good if you do it, but, but, but. But when I read that this is a transfer of the energy of our nature that takes place in the favor of the Spirit, since we are organic with the kingdom of God in the church today, we have the, the right, in fact the duty, to start depositing in our so-called spiritual account that which will live beyond us in this physical life. And of course, our Lord is not talking about scoring heavenly brownie points. We're created in God's image and likeness. We all know that. The inner eye of our heart or soul, which is called the noos or the intellect, the higher aspect, was originally clear, unstained, and focused on God and not on self. The fathers teach that Adam and Eve were created sinless, but were not yet fully developed or perfect, despite what we learned in our Calvinist and Reformed traditions. They and we were created to grow into the likeness of God, again, the ladder of divine ascent. And this potentiality was given to them in seed form. And the true human vocation then and now is to pursue God-likeness. So while we acknowledge that our wills are tainted, bent, and we have a predisposition to sin, I was born in iniquities and in sins did my mother conceive me, as the psalmist tells us, God opened the gates of paradise again by sending his son to die on the cross and to enter into death, the great enemy of man, to become the second Adam, the entirely selfless lover of mankind. And through his life, teaching, passion, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and promised second coming accomplishes the work of salvation. And God offers this free gift to salvation to all who will receive it. So asceticism, the fathers teach, is man's response to God's loving gift. It's like Christmas. You get the gift. It's wrapped up. But if you sit there and look at it and don't take action to open it, you don't receive it. The ascetic practices prescribed by the great physician and his church 
are therefore the spiritual medicines or the antidotes that heal the passions, and the church is the spiritual hospital where the cures are administered. Just to read, talk, and think about a treatment for cancer is not the cure. Submitting oneself to the actual therapy is the cure. Some are healed immediately. Saint Simeon the theologian was healed very quickly and had experienced theodia fairly quickly as a young man. For the rest of us, it takes, takes a process. And we can see the healing and cure in the saints, which is why we honor them, many of whom have literally acquired clear vision and can thus see things incomprehensible to most of us, who manifest remarkable charisms and live as if in another dimension with their focus on God. And we see this in contemporary saints, like St. Saint John the Wonder Worker, St. Porfidios, and St. Paisios. So as mentioned, the corrupted passions in us are many and manifold. Interestingly, in this research I was studying, raise your hand, how many, or give me a shout, how many logismoi, or thoughts, per day? Scotty, don't answer it, because you know the answer to this. Do we have, on average? Anybody? How many thoughts a day do you think we have? Five million? Well, maybe a little, maybe a little high. A billion. They say the average is about 4,000. When you break that down, it comes to three to five per minute. If you watch them, which I've started to try to do, you go, whoa, where'd that come from? Where's that going? What is this? It's amazing what, what goes on. And when we give ourselves over to them knowingly or unknowingly, as opposed to identifying them, we block the Holy Spirit in us. So struggle against the passions and for the virtues is like the receiver for the grace of God. The greater and more decisive these efforts are. And that's why we honor the monks and the nuns. You wonder, why do we pay, you know, why is monasticism held up so high? No, they're not better people than we are. They would say they're more sinful people than we are. They're not on an elevated plane. They're just struggling more and more decisively with their efforts. The greater the grace-filled help is that attracts God. The more forcefully we battle, the more intense the efforts of our will, the greater is the grace we'll receive from God. So there's a synergy between how much we do and put out and long for and how much God washes us and blesses us with his response. So the purpose of each ascetic effort, and I am coming towards the end, whether it be standing for long periods attentively in church, vigils, keeping a daily rule of prayer, following the cycle of the fasts and the feasts, giving alms, confessing our sins regardless of how foolish or sinful or embarrassing it may appear, following, uh, receiving the sacraments rather, praying the Jesus prayer, watchfulness and attentiveness over our four to 5,000 thoughts a day, restricting our willful desires, obedience to a discerning spiritual father, reading daily scripture, being a part of a spiritual community. Just a quick word on that. I have just realized that being part of a spiritual community is part of the spiritual struggle. Why? Because we all have passions. They're bouncing off each other. We all have logismoi. They're all bouncing off each other. We're all gossipers, we're all talkers, we're all thinkers, we're all, you know, this is where, this is the laboratory, this is where it all comes out. And so, the, the good news is, this is where it can be cured as well. And these are prescribed to purify our hearts, so as to, uh, so as to cure our spiritual blindness, to lead us out of self-love and to love of God and our fellow man. So the ascetic work, in summary on this part, should not be seen primarily as a deprivation, but as a cleansing, a transformation, a cure, a detox. This word is interesting, because I'm going through a cleansing right now, a liver cleansing. And I got to say, it's tough. It makes you feel weird. You have to eat funny foods. You can't, you know, you have 
different energy level, but its goal is to make us healthy, make me healthier, and uh, so on. And this is what the ascetic disciplines are also all about: to purify and cleanse, and recleanse our soul, so that when we leave this plane of existence, we're not carrying with us as a sponge takes up all the stuff, all the garbage of this life. And each passion, gluttony, fornication, avarice, sorrow, despair, etc., has a spiritual antidote in the therapeutic tradition of the church, which I left in the back. And the application comes from a discerning spiritual father, but it can also be applied by each of us if we know what they are. Because we don't want to become enslaved to the physical and psychological passions and carry them with us when our soul departs this life. So I'm going to take a brief run-through of the classic passions and their ascetic antidotes as prescribed by the Holy Fathers. First, gluttony. And gluttony is not only about how much we eat, although it's, it's so interesting that in the world we live in, we've got these, uh, this whole new culture of foodies and you know, all, all this stuff and food has become you know, a, a connoisseur activity and people are really into knowing exactly, you know, I, I was out for dinner and I heard somebody say the other week, can you discern the cayenne pepper in this so-and-so? I'm thinking to myself, what? Can I discern the cayenne pepper? It wasn't me, it was somebody else, but they were like trying to figure out what the spices were that the chef put in it. Gluttony is not only about how much we eat, but as St. John the Damascene says, it's about a gluttonous soul or spirit. We can be gluttonous about many things other than just food. And its antidote is moderation, regular times of fasting, abstinence in food and drink, so as to restore balance between body and soul, between penitence and rejoicing, and between us and the world around us, which is very interesting. Do you know how it is when you have people over for Christmas and they're, they're not orthodox, they don't get it, and you sort of feel like you have to follow the fast? Or everybody is partying at Christmas time, eating, drinking champagne, you know, going crazy with the food, and we are strictly following the fast, and you think, whoa, this is like, I'm, a, I'm in a different culture. Well, that's part of what we're supposed to feel, that we are separated from the world. That's one of the benefits of fasting. Fornication or lust, number two. On the basic level, chastity, which is its antidote, is control over one's sexual impulses. But other antidotes are godly marriage and moderation in the bedroom. We're not given license to pursue every sexual practice and excess. Fasting from sexual activity at appointed times, discussed with your spouse and your spiritual father. Attentiveness, watchfulness over one's thoughts and imaginations. And of course, staying away from pornography and all its uh, all its forms. Shocking. 85% of men under 30 are addicted to pornography. Even more shocking, 70% of women under 30 are addicted to pornography. Blew my mind. As St. John Climacus also advises, an antidote to fornication and lust is contemplation of death and the Jesus prayer. I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. What I used to do when I was a younger man and had much more of these impulses than I do now as an older man, <laughs> when I was attracted to a woman by sight, what I would do when I became Orthodox, I would Im immediately see her in a coffin. I was an ambulance paramedic, saw a lot of dead people. So I could picture what that person would look like. Boy, did it have an effect on my lust. Three, avarice, love of wealth. Just as gluttony is the passion that distorts our definition of need in relation to food and drink, avarice is the passion that distorts our definition of need in relation to money and luxury. And the main antidotes to avarice are non-acquisitiveness. Boy, I shouldn't be talking about this one, but it's for my own benefit. Almsgiving and charitable giving. 
And again, this is not only for the wealthy. As St. John Chrysostom and many of the church fathers have said, to give from our poverty is even more valuable and even greater in God's eyes than to give from our abundance. Anger. The fathers teach that the root of the passions is anger, uh, is pride and conceit. Anger is related directly to pride and conceit. And we're not speaking of righteous indignation, that is anger at sin, but of anger that arises from wounded pride, of not getting what one thinks he or she deserves or needs. Well, the spiritual antidote classically to anger is meekness, M-E-E-K-N-E-S-S. Meekness, not being full of self. But there's a practical three-step solution for anger, which is also taught by St. John Climacus. One, keep the lips silent when the heart is stirred, and keep the fingers off the keyboards for emails or Facebook. Kevin, remember that. Remember, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, and a protecting door round about my lips, as we chant every Vesper service. Two, silence our thoughts when the soul is upset. That is, do not dwell on an offense or think badly of those who have wronged or wounded us. Be calm when unclean winds are blowing. That is, do not take offense, but remain dispassionate at insults or injuries to our pride. Tough to do, but that's what the fathers call us to do. Despondency and despair. Dejection or low spirits and despondency according to the fathers, can be cured. In the case of despondency, unremitting prayer and the remembrance of God and the future life is the main antidote. Further, the fathers counsel us to face our despondency, to endure it and go through it, with the knowledge that Christ is there with us every step of the way. And obviously in extreme cases, you know, the fathers didn't then and the Contemporary theologians don't today say that medications or other therapies are not called for. We're not Christian scientists, thank God. And in the case of dejection, or very low spirits, the fathers recommend detachment and dispassion towards created things. And again, these are all listed on the sheet I have in the back. Sorrow, which is often patristically called lethargy or listlessness. This refers to spiritual light laziness. It's a laziness to prayer, coming to church services, reading of the scriptures, following the daily prayer rule, etc. It's, you know, being down spiritually and indifference. Well, St. John of the Latter suggests two things. One, thinking of our own sins, and two, thinking of the eternal blessings that will await the faithful. And daily reading of the scriptures is also there to instill in us a desire for prayer. And I am coming to an end here. Seven, self-esteem, vanity, and vainglory. According to the Holy Fathers, this is the beginning of pride. And pride is what most of the church fathers call the beginning and the end of all evil. And the two antidotes to vainglory are humility, self-awareness, and honesty, honesty of what one truly is. Honest and regular confession, not just confessing the stuff you think is not going to be embarrassing, but confessing, you know, who you are, what you really think, what the true trajectory of your thoughts and dispositions are, regardless of what Father Confessor will think. Modesty in behavior and dress, thinking oneself more sinful, not less, than others. Constant repentance, simplicity, and a non-hypocritical mode of behavior. That is, not being one way in public and another way in the presence of others. And struggling for authentic humility. And eight, pride. St. John of the Latter writes of pride. Pride begins where vainglory leaves off. Its midpoint comes with the shameless parading of our achievements, complacency and unwillingness to be found out. How many of us want to be found out what we're really like? You know, we've got a young man, I won't mention his name, obviously, who I really admire. He's so honest. He's not here today. 
And he, when we were talking over coffee, he told me things about himself and was like, whoa. But what impressed me about him was he wasn't trying to impress me clearly because what he was telling me was not very impressive. He was not unwilling to be found out. And I really came to love this guy and admire him because what he told me was nothing I hadn't done or thought. It's just it's stuff I wouldn't probably tell anybody. And it ends with spurning of God's help and ex exalting of one's own efforts and a devilish disposition. This is what pride leads to. And according to Christian tradition, pride was the sin that brought down the devil. Pride in its purest form is rejection of God. And the antidotes to pride, and there are many, are meekness and simplicity, or cultivating a childlike innocence. Humility, which St. John of the Latter says, is constant forgetfulness of one's achievements. The admission that one is the least important and also the greatest sinner. That one is weak and helpless. Contrition of soul and the abdication of one's will. You know, marriage is a great aid to the abdication of one's will, especially if one works with it. You know, I've tried to work on that. I'm, honey, I'm not sure if you're aware that I've tried, but <laughs> I am trying. You know, what I'm trying to do is just do what my wife says. You know, even if I don't necessarily feel like it or want to do it. I, I, I should say I'm doing it out of love for my wife. <laughs> Truth is, I'm doing it because I want to ab, ab, abnegate my own self-will. I hope it'll turn into doing it for love of my wife. But I do love her. So in summary and conclusion, the purpose of asceticism is to reassert the proper order in our soul and body, to retrain the human person not to be attracted and dominated by transient and created things, but rather to put them in their proper perspective and context and to prepare us, therefore, for entry into the heavenly kingdom. And I think a fitting close are two quotes from Holy Scripture that really sum up this discussion succinctly. And again, one of the things I love so much about the Orthodox mindset is that it allows us to read Scripture and to really get it. As an evangelical, you have to forget so much of what is in the text so that it makes sense with the Reformed viewpoint. But in Orthodoxy, you can believe everything Scripture tells you because it informs our Orthodox tradition. So this comes out of 2 Corinthians. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to its completion in the fear of God. Isn't that wonderful? And two, this comes from 1 John, and I love this one. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But, what we, but we know that when, when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Is this not part of our ethos? It's what our ethos is. And I'll end with a quick story that, about how this research that I've done and communicated today has affected my own thinking. You know, after the fast of the Dormition of the Nativity ended, Colleen and I broke the fast by going out to a Chinese restaurant because we're so ascetic for dinner. And with the check, they delivered, as they usually do, two fortune cookies, you know, along with the bill. And I opened mine, and it read, you are going to have a very comfortable life. Well, before I did this study, I would have been very pleased with this so-called fortune. But instead, I immediately thought, I am not so sure having a, quote, very, uncom very comfortable life is actually good for my soul. So thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. And um, I'm not actually going to answer questions because I'm certainly not an expert on this or anything. But I thought maybe your questions can open up some discussion. We have a, uh, a, a monastic father here today. We have our priests here. And some of you may be able to 
uh, enter into the conversation. So if anybody has a thought or a comment or a question, uh, but we are recording this for Ancient Faith Radio, so Scotty will uh, give you the uh, mic. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming here. Thank you for preparing so well for it. We appreciate that. And I can't believe you're 65. You look at, at the most 55. I like you. So, <laughs> so whatever you're doing, keep doing it. You look good. Um, uh, if you could just expand a little bit on the relationship between the spirit, the soul, and the body. And also, if um, you can talk more about something I heard for the first time. And I, go do, I, I do go to a lot of lectures, but I haven't heard of this that you mentioned earlier, where the, to be in the presence of God, you have to be perfect. I mean, I know Christ said, you have, be perfect as your heavenly Father is in heaven, so, but the, we can't. So how, how is that going to be attainable, and otherwise we'll all be casted out? Thank you. Well, that's, first I'll only speak to the second one first. I was actually thinking about incorporating that question into, into my question, because that's the key question. And that's certainly a question that, that non-Orthodox evangelicals would ask of us. How can you possibly be perfect enough to ever be in the presence of God? Well, I'd love for some of the, our, our father and, and, and our, our spiritual fathers to respond to that in a minute. But my reasoning is, and please correct me if what I say is not right, is twofold. Number one, there isn't a singular standard of what perfection means, right? I, my patron saint, thank God, is Saint Seraphim of Seraph. I chose him because I came out of the charismatic tradition of Protestantism, and he was the first charismatic Orthodox elder that I met, and he was very, very ascetic. Um, I'm ashamed to have his name because I'm nowhere near it, but I cannot be and will not achieve his level of perfection. And this is why I believe St. Simeon the theologian speaks about levels of perfection. Let me give you my answer in the, in the form of a grandfather, of which I have four. When I see my kids, my grandkids, exerting effort to do their homework, it makes me joyful. When they tell me, Papa, I didn't get an A, I don't cast them into the closet with no food for three days because they didn't get an A. What I remember is they worked hard, they tried, they cared. They loved what we said about you need to learn, you need to study. When I see my, my daughter who's in the back sent me a picture of my grandson praying and crossing himself in front of the icons, I started crying. I thought to myself, well, at least I've done one thing right in my life. My grandson is pursuing this life. He's seven years old, right? I don't think God is going to condemn any of us who have tried as hard as we are able to seek after God. Now, will I be sitting on the same bench next to St. Seraphim in paradise? I certainly hope so, but I don't know that I will. Um, so number one, I'm not sure that there's one threshold you understand what I'm saying? That one must achieve, or so much one must do. So you say to the, to the father from the local monastery here, um, why are you doing more than I'm doing? And he can answer us, but I would think it would be because this is what I have chosen. I want to strive. I'm, a, I, I'm an athlete, right? Why does Scott Larson run? How many miles a, a, a week do you run, honestly? Come on. Okay. I would say he probably runs 15 to 20 miles a week. More than that. Okay. But he runs 40 to 50 miles a week. Okay. I've started running. I cannot be on his level, but I can run the race. So I think that what God calls us to, and, and again, fathers, please speak if you want to, it's not about how much you do, how much you achieve. And that's also why we pray what all the time? Lord, have mercy. You know, if my, when my grandchildren come to me and, and beg for something, am I going to turn them down because they didn't work hard enough at it? Probably not. 
I'm going to have mercy on them. Um, and, and I think it's a combination of all these things. As far as the, um, your first question, the relationship of body, soul, spirit, what I found fascinating about this study, and I'm not an expert on this at all, um, really is that we have these three factors that play into our experience of what we call our life, right? We have these physical needs and these physical draws and these physical issues. Some of us have health issues, right? We, and, and younger men have different stuff going on. Then we have this soul life. The soul is the animating force of the body. It was given to us by God. It's where our consciousness dwells, right? And it has its thoughts, feelings, and desires, which if purified, will be more receptive to the Spirit, right? Where and when do we get the Holy Spirit? We believe in the sacramental church that we receive it at baptism, which is why I believe, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, why we baptize babies. We want their noose to be opened and affected. We don't want to wait till they're whatever age they do in other faith traditions, you know? And so, in the world, the relationship between body, soul, spirit is turned the other way. It's all body, mostly body, and primarily soul. But the question is, which aspect of the soul, as St. Theophanes the Recluse says, is dominating the soul space, right? Is it the thoughts? You know, I was a big soul music fan, you know, James Brown and all those guys when I was a kid. And they talk about soul. What soul were they talking about? They were talking about thoughts, feelings, desires, right? Mostly sexual. Many of them sexual. Um, that's not the soul that we want to take with us because the body is going to stay here. The soul is, is, is where our consciousness dwells, where our noose dwells. It's going to go with us. We want that, as the quote in the scripture says, to be as purified and as connected to the spirit of God as possible. And the spirit is that which we receive the baptism, but we often gloss over or is often blocked out, dirty. The, the church fathers talk about it like being like a beautiful painting, right? Which is covered with years and years and years of dirt, wax. And you need a restorer to come in and to take off the layers of dirt and bad varnish to restore the nature of the beautiful painting. A Rem, think of a Rembrandt with that incredible color or the Dutch masters with that light that just pops through. That's the ultimate goal of the Christian life is to theoria, theoria, to have the experience of God. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's about the best I can do. <laughs> Anybody want to make a comment on that? Father Wayne, Father Michael, Father? Humility, can't handle it. All right. Uh, in a follow-up to that, uh, his question earlier, one of the things that's important to me is it seems like living in America, we don't have a language. We don't have a history of really understanding the very things you're talking about, the nature of this, uh, the soul, it's the different parts of the soul, the spirit. We don't, ha we don't have a common language for that. But, and as having come from Protestantism, I've been struggling trying to get a proper understanding of that so I can begin to notice what parts, what, what kind of conversations uh, are coming from where, what I should be doing with what. And I'm, I'm hearing you're engaged in that conversation as you are as well. I'm wondering what books have you read, what materials have you seen that really helped you, particularly in that area of understanding who we are and how all this works. Well, two parts of that. Number one, um, pick up the reference sheet because it's got all the books that I read that 
um, I studied to come to this. St. Theophon the Recluse, uh, The Path to Salvation, is excellent. He's really a, a, a psychologist of the soul. He was a working bishop and retired over some of the nonsense that was going on in his diocese and decided to close the doors and write books. Um, the other thing that I would say, and, and, and I don't mean this to be negative, is that I think in the Orthodox Church we're lacking, to some extent, how to put this, taking the patristic kirgama teaching into the modern world in language that moderns and postmoderns can really understand. I think that's a mission that is greatly needed. You know, because most of our contemporaries, when you, you know, I had a young lady that asked me something to read, and I told her St. Athanasius, and she looked at me like, St. who? I, I mean, you know, she should read on the Incarnation, because she was talking about penal substitutionary atonement, and where do you get your weird view of non-penal substitutionary atonement? But my point is, is that I don't think we have enough work done on making the patristic teachings of the church really accessible to um, modern terminology, language, and so on. We've got a lot of psychobabble in the Protestant church, you know, where we hear all the psycho talk. Um, what we need to do is we need to have the patristic teachings that engage in the psycho and spiritual life brought into modern language so people can really, like you were asking, really understand, so what does this really mean? Why is pornography bad for me? You know, how, how can I spend better? What is asceticism and why should it, how does it affect my psychosocial life, you know? So, but, but uh, I've got some books there on, on the uh, references that you can, that you can uh, read. Yeah, Ruth. Uh, I just have some thoughts. Um, <clears throat> to embrace uh, ascetic, the teachings of the church, um, it's almost like we have to um, turn our will to want that and believe it's even possible. And um, just a couple of things that happened in my life that made me understand the teachings, are, I'm actually supposed to pay attention to that. Um, one was, um, I was at St. Paul's, um, and there was a uh, monk from St. Catherine's, and he was speaking to us in Greek, and he was telling us the teachings of the fathers in person, and it was the first time it struck me like, oh, I'm supposed to pay attention to these teachings, like they're meant for me. They're not like these high up, uh, crazy instructions you know, so, so that was the first turning for me. But then um, another thing was I went to a talk by um, Bentley Hart, and he speaks in this crazy, like, really high vocabulary. And, David Bentley Hart, the yeah, yeah, philosopher. Yeah, um, but, but he said um, Christ became man without compromise. And that struck me like, whoa. Like, I mean, that's so obvious. Like, of course, he, you know, he's still God when he became man, but um, it just hit me like that I underestimate what man is meant to be. Or capable of doing. Yeah, the fact that God became man without losing his Godhead, that, whoa, like, you know, so the goal that we set for ourselves, I think, is a lot lower than what God really intends us to be. So if we see, like, there's a vision out there um, you know, um, and then the third, the last thing um, I think is that um, uh, I was at uh, Antiochian Village, and there was a teen that was really upset about um, the Senate discussion about gay marriage, and so I was trying to console her. It was impossible, you know. So I went to Vespers, and I'm in, the, I'm in the chapel, and standing next to the wall, 
and there's, I look to my side and there's bare feet there and I get this sense like I can't look up at the icon. And finally, you know, because I'm really, I'm praying because I'm so upset about this girl and realizing like the, all the nation is affected by this. You know, they're troubled by, you know, this whole issue. Um, so I look up and it's St. Mary. Wow. <sighs> and I was like, she's taking this prayer. And, that made, and then and as, as I'm going on that day, I'm realizing like the saints are individuals. And we're all individuals. Right? So just the impact of like what mankind is and who the saints are, it's so um, incredible. So I just wanted to share those stories because I think, I think we're all in that process. And Thanks. Maybe it would help. You know, one of the things that that brings up, and that's, that's great, I appreciate that. You know, one of the, it's not a downside, but one of the things that I've thought of is that, you know, when we hear so much about the monastic saints and their ascetic struggles, um, in, in some ways it can be discouraging. That is, I mean, which one of us can really be St. Mary of Egypt? What I discovered was you don't need to be St. Mary of Egypt to pursue godlikeness. You don't need to be St. Seraphim of Sarah to practice asceticism. But start and move on the path and ask for God's help. You know, but when we hear all the time about St. Mary of Egypt and St. Seraphim, 40 days on the, on the rock in prayer and, you know, um, her lifetime in the Palestine desert. You know, it's like almost beyond our thinking. It's like, it's, it almost becomes, what, what my mind does is it makes legend out of these stories. It makes them inaccessible. I want this stuff to have access. We can do this. We're called to do it. I cannot do it on the level of St. Seraphim. You cannot do it probably uh, on the level of St. Mary. But can we do things every day to fight avarice? lust, anger, pride. Yes, we can. So, anybody else have a comment or thought or anything? Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. I just have a quick question. Um, my daughter, um, who's nine. I know her. Yes. <laughs> She's constantly planning her life, like every other day. She's telling me a new goal she has. She was saying she wants to be Orthodox forever. Thank and, God. Yeah. And uh, if she can't be a rock star, <laughs> she'd like to be a nun. But she says, I don't think I'm good enough, so I'll just get married and have kids. So I'm like, well, gee, thanks. You know, I'm married and have kids, but apparently, you know. So my question is, how do you talk to a child about how she can attain um, not necessarily asceticism, but the, the struggles that she's going to have even in any, any role that she plays in life, getting married and she's still going to have you know, things that she can do. I just would like to know how to approach those mm -hmm. topics with her. By the way, that was my daughter. Honey, I'm going to uh, direct you to your spiritual father on that. Because I'm, I'm not really, and, and I would also say Mother Victoria, you know, you had a very close relationship with Father Wayne, and it affected your spiritual journey. I would get Helena connected to our spiritual fathers and have them as, the, as her resource. And also Mother Victoria, you know, she's guided and formed a lot of young women. And, you know, the other thing that I've started to tell Helena is that, um, you know, this quote that I quoted, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven except through many tribulations. So it's not, you know, we as Americans think, oh, we're going to have this perfect life. Get rid of, you know, people that come from other cultures, Romania, they were under the Iron Curtain, you know, uh, Russia, whatever, whatever, you know, Africa. They, they, they understand what suffering is. We don't really get it. Our job as Americans is what? Get rid of suffering. Make it go away. It has no redemptive purpose. But, you know, with Helena, if you explain to her that, look, this is tough, but this is going to strengthen your heart, your spirit, if you understand what you're going through. But talk to your spiritual father about that. Anybody else? Thank you very much for coming and for your attention. Appreciate it.
Yeah, all time years. Yeah.